All right, in our journey through this, uh, this book, in our journey through this series of thought called What on Earth Am I Here For?, today we stop and we camp on the issue of worship. If you've been reading in your book this week, you know that one of the things Rick Warren said is a phrase that is absolutely theologically, biblically true, and yet I find sometimes rather awkward. He, said, he says this, he says that we were created for God's pleasure. We were created to bring pleasure to God. I find that phrase awkward, and, and maybe it's just me being spiritually immature. I don't, know, I don't know, chalk it up to whatever you want to. I find that to be an awkward phrase. I always have. I always have. Now, it's biblically sound. It is biblically true. Let me, let me be absolutely clear. The Bible is clear on this. We were created to bring joy and pleasure to the heart of God. Okay? So that, that's very clear. And so Rick Warren is right on this. I just find the phrase awkward, so I want to unpack it for you the way I think the Lord helped me to unpack that phrase, and then we can jump into the rest of the sermon. I, I, I think that we were created to bring pleasure to the heart of God, but that brings to me this feeling that maybe God is self-centered or self-serving. It just seems odd that God would create us just to bring himself pleasure. That seems almost selfish to me. And that's why I've always struggled with the phrase, until... Until I became a parent. And, and, and I got to tell you, when you become a parent, you, you learn some things about, about this. Because our children bring us great joy and great pleasure. There, there are a few things better than listening to your kids in another room, laughing, cutting up, talking to each other, having conversations. There's few things better than watching your kids excel in life, watching your kids do well in life, watching your, I mean, that brings, that brings so much joy to the heart of a parent. Now, we know this when we have children. And in some ways, we have children because we desire to experience the joy of watching those children enjoy life, move forward in life. The, the, I mean, look, there's just not much better than listening to your kids laugh. And especially when they're little, because it's all cute and all. And then they're older, and they're laughing at you, and it's just another thing altogether. <laughs> you know, and, and so, but, but, but we ourselves have children to some degree so that they might bring joy to our hearts. In the same way, God creates us, and He revels in our presence. He loves to hear us enjoy. He loves to hear us enjoy our lives, and he loves to see us excel in this life he's given us. He gets, he gets joy from that and pleasure from that, and a large portion of why we are here is to bring joy to the heart of God. And so the question becomes, if worship is very central to who we are, and it is, if worship is very central to who God meant for us to be, and it is, then what is worship all about? And we've got to unpack this because we don't really understand worship. You see, if I took a survey in the room here, most of you, if I said, what is worship, you would actually answer in some way, shape, or form, unless the music part of the service is what we do before the preacher preaches. It's when we all sing. And worship is that time with music. And in fact, you know what? I was, I was a pastor in my Almost, I think in my 30s before this ever happened to me, but I, I was walking along and, and I was dealing with somebody in, in, uh, in the music team and I said, I, I said, well, you know, what are we doing for worship? And, and that, I, I misused the phrase too because I meant by that, what are we going to sing? And that's a misuse of that phrase, but that, you know, what, it communicated. And, and he said, well, well, no, 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 we're gonna, not going to do that song for worship. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, no, we're going to do that song for praise. And I said, what? All right. Say, no, that's a praise song. Okay. What's this? Oh, that's a worship song. I was in my 30s. I'm a trained pastor. I've been pastoring for years, and I went, there's a difference. <laughs> and what they meant by this is that a praise song was an upbeat, fast, celebratory song. And a worship song was a slower, more intimate, deeper type song. That's what they meant by that. And I, I sat there and I went, hmm, wow. 
Not only have we defined worship as music, now we've defined worship as a particular type of music. And that's really, really pigeonholed in our thinking. And I have to tell you that defining worship as music at all is incorrect. Defining worship at all as music, simply music, is just wrong. It's not what worship is. It's part of worship. Yes, we worship by singing, but we worship by doing so many other things. Worship is so fundamental in our lives. Worship encompasses every part and piece of who we are. Worship requires a level of, of surrender that is, that, is, that is just so far beyond what we see when we talk about worship. You know, worship, I mean, when we saw, look, this is not a new problem. When I was coming up in the church and we were always singing out of the hymnals, it was a problem then too. We didn't have praise and worship songs because it was all hymns and they were all boring. You know, but the truth is, the truth is that what, what we have to understand is that worship is so much more than that. Let me say something else, else about worship here. Many of us believe that worship is all about victory. We may not say that. We may not use those words, but we do believe that. We believe that worship is something we do when we're giving God praise for some great victory he's put in our lives. And we believe that worship is all about victory. You know, I, 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 I won the lottery. Woo! praise God I worship God you know we won the game praise God I give praise to my Lord Savior Jesus Christ we see athletes do this all the time they win a big game and they start with praise the Lord and I'm glad they do that my favorites though are the boxers they just beat the ever-loving snot out of some other human being I just want to praise Jesus for helping me kill him Somehow I'm, I'm missing that one. Uh, you know, but at any rate, the Lord's in heaven going, hit him again, hit him again, hit him again. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I don't know. I, I'm, somehow I'm not thinking that works for me, you know. At any rate, um, you know, worship, listen, worship is not about singing. And worship is not about victory. I need to t tear down the two main pillars that we've had underneath our understanding of worship. You say, well, then what is it about? Well, I've got a verse. I've got a couple of verses I want you to read. We're going to start in Romans chapter 12. And I want you to take a look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about worship. Read this with me. Let's read together. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. As soon as it gets up there. There we go. Let's read together. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I urge you to offer your bodies as spiritual sacrifices, living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, and this is your spiritual act of what? So worship, according to this verse, according to Paul, worship is really offering up everything I am in a sacrificial sense. That's what worship is. That has nothing to do with singing. Worship can't be defined as singing. It just can't. It just simply can't because if worship were confined to the issue of singing, then you and I both know there are certain humans on this planet that should never even attempt to worship. If worship were defined as dancing, confined to dancing, then I would be one of the humans on this planet that should never even attempt to worship. Can't do it. But worship is not confined to all that. If worship were confined to victory, then anyone who's not experiencing victory in their life should ha has, has no reason, no place to worship at all. But worship is not defined by or confined by any of those things. Worship is, in fact, surrender. Present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Let's read verse 2 of chapter 12. Verse 2 says this, read this with me. 
Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. That thought's going to come back in a little bit. Worship is not about music. Worship is not about victory. Worship is about sacrifice and surrender. Again, the phrase the Apostle Paul uses is, you should present your bodies as living sacrifices. Here's the ultimate question that pops up now. How do I do that? What does that look like, preacher? How in the world am I, what, what, I'm supposed to climb the volcano and fling myself in? What does that mean? Look, to understand that, Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Let's go to Luke chapter 10 and let's begin to unpack what does it mean to live my life as a living sacrifice? What does it mean to actually offer my life in worshipful surrender to the God of heaven? Read this verse with me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. We read this verse in this case in Luke. But friends, I got to tell you, Luke is not by far the first time this verse shows up. This phrase shows up first in Deuteronomy. Moses gives it to the people of Israel and says to them, here's how you follow God. Here's how you live for God. He starts with, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, and, and he teaches them all the way back at the time of Moses to follow God this way. This is, this is the great commandment from God. This is how we live our lives. So what if our spiritual act of worship, presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, could be broken down into this very central phrase? Not just to Judaism, but also to Christianity. What if we could put this thought together and say, I'm going to present myself as a living sacrifice, and I'm going to do it using this phrase. What would that look like? That's what I want to unpack for us today. Because I'm convinced that God has called us to fully 100% surrender to Him. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I'm convinced that victory is not really part of the Christian experience. I'm convinced that the Christian experience is all about my ability to surrender to God. And if God brings victory around me, the victory is his, not mine. My job is surrender. And then I can enjoy my God's victories when he brings them. But my job is surrender. And I got to tell you, I believe for too long we have, we have pounded on victory and forgotten about surrender. And I believe it's frustrated us. I'm not stealing our joy today. I believe I'm going to alleviate some frustration today. Let's jump in. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. If I am truly going to surrender to God, if I am truly going to worship God by having a life that is fully, totally, completely surrendered to Him, then I must have surrendered desires in my life. I must surrender the desires of my heart to God. Surrender desires is the starting point for this. And the truth is, if my heart is to be fully surrendered to Him, then I've got to give Him my desires. Now, we don't like this. We don't want anybody coming after our desires. Oh, my desires, that's just who I am. It's just what I want. I just, no, 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 no. You surrender those to desires to God. We don't like that because we want what we want and we want it when we want it and how we want it and where we want it and why we want it. And we don't want anybody to ask what we want. We just want what we want. But God says, no, I don't want you to want what you want. I want you to want what I want, and I'm going to take over your wants. I'll change your desires if you'll let me. And when you allow God to change your desires, you change the core of what is driving you in your life. We've decided somehow in this culture that our desires are our God. 
And rather than surrender to our God and what he wants in our lives, we surrender to our desires and we've said, that's really what drives me. I have this desire. I have this passion. I have this preference. And because I have this desire, this passion, or this preference, that means God must have made me this way. So I've got to follow my desire, my passion, my preference. And it turns us into nothing more than dogs. And we chase around like we have no control over the base urges in our lives. Friends, I'm here to tell you that if you are going to worship God truly, you must surrender your desires to God. And let me be very blunt about this. We're going to go PG-13, so if you want to put your hands over your child's ears, you go ahead and do that, all right? But let me be very blunt about this. We are generally okay with, with, with being told to control all desires that are not sexual. We don't have a problem with saying, saying to someone, you need to deal with your eating desire. You get that under control. We don't have a problem with saying to somebody, you need to deal with your drinking desire. You got to get that under control. We don't have a problem with saying to somebody, all these other desires we have no problem with coming against, but we don't want God getting up in our bedroom. But I'm here to tell you that I've read in my Bible. And my Bible says there's nowhere you can go to escape the presence of God. The Bible's clear on this. The Bible says that the presence of God descends all the way down into the, depth, into the depths of hell. And if God is in the depths of hell, he's in your bedroom. Now, it just freaks some of y'all out. Some of y'all are not going to be right for weeks. But I'm here to tell you, you've got to surrender all, all of those desires to God. And that is your spiritual act of worship. That is, that is becoming a living sacrifice is taking my entire heart, my desires, and surrendering them to the God who would change them into what he wanted them to be in the first place. The truth is, y'all, listen, I'm not picking on anybody in particular. We all have desires that are messed up. Everybody in here. I mean, we could, if you wanted to, nobody would do it, but we could go person by person, and they could tell you, well, my screwed up desire is this one. And y'all would go, oh, and then you would stand up and say, my screwed up desire is this one. And the rest of us would go, oh, because that's not ours. We've got to surrender those desires to the God who wants to redeem them and sanctify them. So if we're going to worship God, we start by having surrendered desires. But it moves on. It says not only to say that, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. The soul is that part of you that is the core of who you are. It's that part of you that science can't find and dissect and study. It's that part of you that science can't even prove is there, but everybody knows is there. It's that part of you that nobody can quite figure out, but they know it's there, and it's the core of who you are. It's the very core of what makes you you. And so not only must we have a surrendered desires, we must love the Lord our God with all our heart, we must surrender our identity to God, the very core of who we are. We must love the Lord our God with all of our soul. The very core of what defines us must be surrendered to God. Now, this is a struggle for an American mindset. Because an American mindset says, no, I'm going to be me. It's individuality. It's me being an individual. And we have, listen to me, we have sacrificed the worship of the God of heaven on the altar of individuality. And we must not do that. We must be willing to be fully, 100% defined by the God of heaven. You say, no, no, I don't want to be like that. I want, it to be, I want to be me. I just got to be me. Hey, I mean, I don't know. But I'm telling you, stop that. Be his, not yours. Because he has a plan for you. That's the whole point of this whole series. God created you for a reason. And that soul that is inside of you, listen, listen, you got to hear me. That soul that is inside of you that, that defines you, 
that core of who you are that science can't find and dissect and study and that stuff, that part of who you are, that's the part of you that is made in the image of God. That's actually the part of you that yearns and cries out and clamors forth to try to get closer and closer at all times to God. That's the part of you that desires to be identified with and by God. And we must surrender the very core of who we are. We must surrender our identity to God. And that that means some things. It'll change the way I act. Yeah, you know, I'll act one thing if I'm just, you know, if I if I'm just, you know, nobody on the street, I'll act one way. But if I'm a child of the king, I'll act differently. My expectations of the world are different. If I'm a child of the king, my expectations of myself are different. If I'm a child of the king, the way I carry myself in public is different. When I identify myself as a child of the king, it changes the way I live my life. Which kind of brings us to the next point. Because it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So I have to have surrendered desires. That's all my heart. I have to have a surrendered identity. That's all your soul. And I have to have surrendered actions. That's all my strength. That's all my strength. Now, folks, I want to tell you, and I want to speak to two sides of this. I want to speak to two sides of this point. The first side I want to speak to is all those who are from the holiness Pentecostal background. Let me talk to you. We have for our lifetimes, most of us, done this backwards. What we have done is we have tried to take our strengths, change our actions, and by changing our actions, change our heart and our soul. And it's been frustrating. And then we do that because that's what they tell us to do. Check all the boxes, you know, get up at 4.30 and do your devotions. You know, uh, read through 10 chapters by 5.30, pray till 8.30, go to work, be the best human on the planet, even though you haven't had sleep in a month. Um, you know, do it, yeah, they just give you this, this checklist, wear this, don't wear that, put this on, don't do that, do your hair this way, not that way, let the skirt be there, not there, let the, you know what I'm saying? They got all these rules and regulations and what we've, what we've believed, what we've taught by accident, I think is that if you'll change your actions, you'll change your heart. If you'll change your actions, you'll change your soul. But listen, I'm telling you, that's backwards. It won't work that way. You will live your life frustrated if that's how you approach that. Take it in the order it just came in the Scripture. Change your heart. Change your soul. And by changing your desires, by letting God have control of your desires, by surrendering your desires to God, by surrendering your identity to God, those two things will naturally change your actions. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. That's going to take a while. That is not going to happen overnight. You, you can't, God won't, God can but he likely won't change your actions, your desires, your, your, your identity overnight. It'll take a while for you to start surrendering all the desires because you know what's going to happen? Let me tell you what's practically going to happen. You're going to start changing your desires. You're going to say, yes, I hear it, Pastor Mike. I got you. I got to change my desires. And you're going to pick one. You say, there's the desire. That's the one. That's the one. And you're going to say, I surrender this desire to you. And then tomorrow you won't take it back. And then by tomorrow night, you're going to feel bad about taking it back, so you're going to give it back to him. And maybe you'll make it two days, and then you're going to take it back. And then you're going to realize, oh, man, I took it back again. And you're going to go, God, I'm sorry. You're going to hand it back to him. And maybe about four days later, you're going to take it back. And then finally, one day, you're going to wake up, and you're going to say, man, I have surrendered that desire to God. I'm done. Woo-hoo! And then all of a sudden, you're going to go, oh, what about that one? This is a slow, lifelong process. But listen, when your desires change, your actions must change with them. And if you'll work on changing the desires, you'll find the actions follow naturally. And if you'll work on changing the identity, you'll find that the actions follow naturally. Now, 
Speak to the other side of this. I have heard people who say, my actions have no bearing on my salvation. Let me be gentle. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> That's just dumb. If you want to say my actions have no bearing on my salvation, I dare you to read the Old Testament. I just dare you. Oh, we're in the New Testament now, brother. Yeah, but God didn't change. I don't know. We didn't get a new God in the New Testament. We got a new covenant. God still expects the same things. My actions absolutely have bearing on my salvation. My actions absolutely matter in my life. It matters that I do right things. So you can't just dismiss actions. It's not important. But you can't put actions above changing your heart and changing your your identity. All of these things have to work together. Actions are important. They matter. You've got to change. Look, look, look. Can I, can I ask you to please? Can I ask you to do me a favor? Can I please? I got you got it. You got to help me out here, all right? If you go act like the devil, stop claiming Christ. Y'all all right? I'm not trying to be difficult here. I'm just, I just got to tell you, if, look, if you are in here saying, I'm a Christian, praise Jesus, I'm a Christian, praise Jesus, I'm a Christian, praise Jesus, and then you're living like the devil all week, you are not bringing glory and worship to God. You are demeaning the name of God. Because people are hearing you say, I'm a Christian, then they're seeing you live like that, and they think God's okay with how you're living. When you know full well God's not, but you're teaching something that's not right. So if you're going to act like the devil claiming, at least be honest about it. Can you do me that? Well, I ain't living like the Bible says. All right, then just tell everybody you're a heathen pig dog sinner and move on. (laughs) It's not illegal. In fact, it might make you famous. But I'm going to tell you, it'll ruin your life. But if you're going to call the name of Jesus, live up to it. Let your actions follow what you say. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, surrendered desires. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, a surrendered identity. Love the Lord your God with all your strength, surrendered actions. And love the Lord your God with all your mind, surrendered thoughts. Now, this may be the hardest one I throw at you all day. This may be the toughest one you get today. This is the one that is really difficult to actually get control of. I remember all the old preachers. I mean, I grew up around, I grew up around holiness folks. I mean, holiness folks. I mean, holiness folks, you know. And, um, and I remember all the preachers, they'd come in and say, Oh, I have allowed the Lord. I've brought every thought under the control of the Holy Spirit. I would go, dude, wow. That dude is so much more spiritual than I will ever be in my entire life. I mean, I'm one of those people that I'm not there yet, you know? And yet, y'all, y'all don't do this, so y'all just keep a spiritual face, all right? Y'all just put a, that face, keep that face, all right? But, but like sometimes I'll be praying along, you know, and I'm praying, Lord, I'm praying. And all of a sudden, this thought goes through my mind, and I'm just, and all of a sudden, my pretty butterfly. <laughs> and then I realize what I'm thinking about. It's like, ooh, <laughs> sorry, Lord. <laughs> You're, you're still here, aren't you? <laughs> wow. You know, I can't believe I had that thought during prayer. You know. <clears throat> Come on now, you know you've done that. <laughs> Don't even act like you ain't done that. Y'all have been in church before. And you've looked around right in church and you've got, oh, Lord, I'm going to die right here. It don't matter if they got the shocker thing. I am gone. I am gone. You know, God's going to hit me with the lightning. Y'all back up. You know, look, bringing our thoughts under the full control of the Holy Spirit is difficult, time consuming, lifelong work. But it's worthwhile. Watch this. Think about this just a minute. 
if I ever arrive at the place, and I believe you can, okay, I believe you can. John Wesley used to say that, John Wesley always taught about, about holiness, but he, he actually believed that holiness, true holiness, true entire sanctification was probably for the older saints. I think he's probably right. Not the younger saints shouldn't pursue it. Don't get me wrong. The earlier you start pursuing it, the earlier you'll get there, okay? Everybody's got that? But, but, but it takes a lot of time. And, but think about this. If you ever once get to the point that your desires are surrendered to God and your identity is surrendered to God and your thoughts are surrendered to God, how can your actions possibly do anything against God? See what we're after? No, wait, 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 wait. We're talking about worship. But if I get to the place that my desires and my identity and my, and my thoughts are all centered up on God and that forces my actions to be centered up on God, then everything I do with every waking moment, with every breath, brings glory to the God who saved me and gave me life. That's what God's after. That's what worship is really about. It's not just about singing. Might I suggest that you stop working on your voice so much and start working on your vice a little bit? Might I suggest that we set, set the music aside for a while and allow the momentum of the Spirit of God to change our lives so that in every step, in every moment, in everything we do, we bring glory to the God of heaven who made us. Might I suggest that worship take over every part of who we are? That's worship. Wait, I'm not done yet. Because I got five points. And I've only done four. And some of y'all are going, come on, preacher. It's enough. I'm going to have to go to the altar for all four of these. And you've got another one. I got one more. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's a surrendered desire. Love the Lord your God with all your soul. That's surrendered identity. Love the Lord your God with all your strength. That's surrendered actions. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. That's surrendered thoughts. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's surrendered compassion. I'm going to tell you something. You can't stop at the first four. Far too many church people try to stop after the first four. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind, and they say, there it is, that's what i got to chase, and they stop there and they focus on those four. But that will not make you godly. That will make you selfish. Because if you stop and think about it, loving the Lord with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength and all my mind is all about me. And that's not what God called you to. I need you to hear me. What God does in you is not for you. We'll say it again. What God does in you is not ultimately for you. It's for someone else. It's to reach someone else. It's to touch the heart and the mind and the life of someone else. You say, come on, preacher. God, what, God just needs to do this for me. No, no, no. Don't get me wrong. There's going to be blessings in your life because he did these four things in you. But if you don't allow those to flow out, you become nothing more than a sour old sponge that soaked up too much sweetness for a while. And if a sponge soaks up too much stuff for a while and is left to sit in the rotting sweetness of the sweet water it sopped up, it will become sour, it will stink, and it will be worthless to anyone. And I describe far too many Christians in far too many churches when I talk like that. We must have a surrendered compassion. A compassion that understands that God has brought us to where we are so that we can reach out and change the lives of people around us. God is not here simply to grow us up. God is here to grow us up, make us strong, so that we might reach a world that desperately needs to hear what we have. That's why he's done this. That's why he's doing this. I've heard people say that discipleship is an end unto itself. No! No! 
No, no. Discipleship is not an end unto itself. Discipleship is, is dramatically, dynamically important, but it is there to build you up so that you might reach other people with the good news that Jesus Christ has placed inside you. The idea is simply this. We will fill you up with Christ, and then when the world shakes you, what spills out on them is the Jesus you are filled with. And there's no other choice but for that to spill out. And if our Christianity, if our spirituality, if our holiness is all about us, we become nothing like the God we claim. Because God could easily have made heaven all about Him and just stayed there. But He didn't. He came here. Worship must play out this way. A fully surrendered individual completely surrendered every part of me to him who then reaches out to a world that desperately needs the God to whom I am fully surrendered. And tell me, how can I say I'm fully surrendered to God when I won't lay my life down to reach those for whom he died? So come on, preacher, this sermon is about worship. I just want to sing. No. This sermon's about worship. We just need to surrender. Luke chapter 10, verse 27, that we've been reading. It comes up because Jesus is having a debate with a guy who's trying to trap him. This teacher of the law is said to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what he's after is he's after Jesus saying something that he can trap the guy, Jesus in his words and he can make Jesus look the fool. Jesus replies to him, well, what does the scripture say? If I could draw this into modern terms out of this Jewish context, what Jesus has actually looked at this man and said is, what did you learn in children's church? Because this verse that he quotes, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, this verse is a verse that every Jewish child would have memorized. What did you learn in Sunday school? And so, verse 27 that we just read, this verse here, this is the man replying to Jesus, this is what it says. Look at Jesus' reply in verse 28. You have answered correctly, he said. Do this, and you will live. Hear me. Surrender your desires to God so you can love Him with your whole heart, and you will live. Surrender your soul to God so that you can love Him with your whole heart, and you will live. Surrender your actions to God so that you can serve Him with all your strength, and you will live. Surrender your mind and your thoughts to God so that you can love Him with all your mind and you will live. Surrender your compassion to God so that you can serve Him to the least, the last, and the lost to the very ends of this planet. And you will live. Do all of that together. And you will finally understand what it means to actually live and live to the fullest extent possible. Because you will live in the presence, the power, the worship, the holiness, the sanctification, the direction of God at all times. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will know what God's will is. His good, pleasing. Remember reading that earlier? I told you it was coming back. You come and ask me, how do I know what God wants in my life? Let me give you Romans chapter 12, verse 2. That's how you're going to know. You say, well, how do I do that? Let me give you Romans chapter 12, verse 1. 
That's how you're going to get there. You say, well, how do I outdo that? Let me, give you, let me give you Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Do it that way. And that's worship. So much more than singing. And yet singing is part of it. Don't get me wrong, God loves music. All the way through Scripture, God loves music. We're going to sing a song here in just a sec. It's a song written by a man named Matt Redman. The story of the song is actually pretty awesome. In the church where Matt Redman was the worship leader, the pastor became convinced that what was going on was that the people had replaced the worship of God with the worship of the music and the light show that was going on every Sunday. It was so well done. It was so sharp. People began to believe that the music was all worship was about. The pastor stepped up one Sunday and he said, here's what we're going to do. We've begun to worship the show instead of the God that it's all about. He said, we're going to unplug the sound system. We're going to get rid of the light show. And we're just going to come to church. And worship's going to be whatever worship is going to be. Matt Redmond writes, he says that he was the worship pastor at the time. He said, quite honestly, when he first said this, I was offended. Because I was the guy doing the music. He said, but the more I prayed about it, God softened my heart. The more I realized God had given this man wisdom. During that period of time when there was no music in the church, Matt Redmond began to process what was being taught. And he wrote a song. It's a song that most of you know. We're going to sing it now. Because it's the first song this church sang when music was reintroduced. And it's a song that actually sings of realizing that we put singing in the wrong place. It's a song that realizes that we got to get back to what really matters when it comes to worshiping God. As we sing this song, here's what I want you to process. Where's your point of surrender? Where do you need to start? You need to start with desires? You need to start with identity? Actions? Maybe you need to start with thoughts. Maybe you need to start actually acting out on what God's called you to in compassion. It's time to process that. The altars are open this morning. If nobody comes, that's fine. But if you want to come pray, if everybody comes, that's fine. If you want to come and kneel here and pray and in front of everybody say, I got to deal with this. I got to make my life worship God. I want to invite you to do that because it's time for us to actually worship God the way we should. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart. Sing with me. And I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. It. When it's all about you. 
It's all about you, Jesus. One more verse, one more chorus. If you need to do business with the Lord down here this morning, I want to invite you to do that. Don't you let fear take this way, this away from you. Hmm. King of endless words, no one could resist how much you deserve. Mm. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. And I'll give you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required And you search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus us. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made, and when it's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you. It's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Father, the heart of worship is all about you. Our role in this is to surrender, surrender completely. And Lord, all across this room, Men and women are surrendering to you in different ways, in different areas. Lord, someone in this room needs your help because their goal is to surrender their desires to you. I pray, Lord, you would assure them that your help will be there. Someone in this room, Lord, needs your help because they need to surrender their identity that's been so warped and damaged by the world and you need to heal it and draw it back up. Help them, Lord. Holy Spirit, someone in this room needs help with actions in particular. And Lord, I, I, I pray that you would give them strength, ability. Holy Spirit, give us the capacity to change the way we think and surrender our thoughts to you. And in the end, give us the ability, the opportunity to reach out to the world around us. And Lord, when it comes down to our lives, once we're surrendered to us, let your praise rise up through us. Let your glory shine through us. Let, let, let your Holy Spirit take over our lives and let us surrender to you to such a distinct point that when people look at us, they see straight through us and see you. Let your presence, your power, your holiness, your, 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 your very person permeate who we are so that it can't help but fall out on those that are around us. Praise, Lord, is rising through us. Let it be true and let folks look at us and see you. In your name we pray.